It's become a cliche at this point, but we are living in a unique moment. The world is reeling from multiple crises. There's the COVID-19 global pandemic, which has caused a staggering death toll. I'm not going to even bother with an estimate because it won't be accurate by the time you watch this. And we're still feeling the impact of protest movements across the globe, sparked by violence against, and the murders of, unarmed black men and women at the hands of police. These protests have prompted discussions and debate about structural racism, the likes of which we haven't seen since the civil rights movement. In particular, many are calling for the defunding of police, or at the very least, major reforms, and an honest evaluation of the role police play in society. I think a lot of people would agree that one of the primary functions of police should be to protect the public from violent crime. But is a heavily armed police force really the best way to address violence? Or have we misdiagnosed the problem? To get a better understanding of what violence is and how it can be stopped, I reached out to an expert in the field who sees violence not as a moral issue, but as a health issue. Violence is the only health issue that isn't primarily managed by the health sector. This is Dr. Gary Slutkin. He's a physician, an epidemiologist. And I founded about 20 years ago the epidemic control approach to reducing violence. This approach is the foundation of an organization called Cure Violence, a public health anti-violence program, of which Gary is the CEO. Today, Cure Violence operates in over 25 cities across the U.S. and Canada, and in over a dozen other countries worldwide, in regions including Latin America, the Middle East, and Africa. But before he was involved with violence prevention, Dr. Slutkin played a lead role at the World Health Organization, helping to reverse the course of global epidemics, including tuberculosis in Somalia and the AIDS epidemic in Uganda. But it wasn't until he returned to America after nearly 10 years abroad that he made the connection that would alter the path of his life's work. Gary was struck by the level of violence that he saw in the U.S. and tried to look at it in a new way. When I first started to look at violence, but I saw it as a stuck problem. And at, at World Health, we have this idea of a stuck problem. A stuck problem is a problem that people are not getting anywhere with. And they just keep trying the same things and they're not getting anywhere. And I learned this at World Health, it's because the diagnosis was wrong. Hmm. And this was true for, the, for plague and leprosy and infectious diseases, mostly because we didn't know about microorganisms. So that means you have to relook at it from start. How does someone relook at something from start Basically, to an epidemiologist or a scientist, you look at the science, the um, research that's been done, and you look at graphs and charts and maps. It's kind of nerdy stuff. Gary looked at homicides in Chicago and was struck by the familiar clustering and distribution that he had seen before. To me, the graphs and charts and maps look exactly like cholera or TB, the waves upon waves, the clustering, Cholera in Bangladesh was exactly like Chicago in violence. The curves of, of cholera in uh, Somalia was like Rwanda, genocide, you know, big spike. But the real aha moment was when I asked a pediatrician, what is the greatest predictor of violence? And she said to me, it's a preceding violent event. And that was the clincher because the greatest predictor of a cold is that someone else had a cold. The greatest predictor of COVID now is someone exposure to COVID. If it produces more of itself, it is contagious. In many things, it's not that way. I mean, what is the greatest predictor of a heart attack? It isn't that someone else had a heart attack. It's high blood pressure or smoking or something like that. So the aha moment to me was this question and this answer. What is the greatest predictor? Answer, it itself, hmm. a preceding event. Violence meets all the essential criteria for being considered a contagious disease. It's even dose-dependent, so like COVID or cholera, the more often you're exposed to violence, the more likely you are to catch it. The only difference is that instead of replicating in the lungs or the intestines, the violence bug is replicated in our brain. Was that a hard sell to get other people on board to the idea of violence as a disease? Because like, you know, violence is a choice, right? It's just, it's one person deciding to shoot or harm another person. I mean, they could always choose not to do that. Well, I mean, did you choose to put on clothes today or did people choose to go to work today? I mean, we end up having habits. We learn how to do things. 
and then we are unconsciously doing it and we're largely doing what people around us do and we see that as normal and we do that as normal. Mm -hmm. Now, all that having been said, in the end, there's an event that someone does or doesn't do, but that's what the purpose of the health system is. It's kind of like a mask that is or isn't worn mm -hmm. or distancing that is or isn't done. We need to help people with these behaviors. And that's what violence interrupters and outreach workers and health workers do in what we call epidemic control. In the late 90s, Dr. Slutkin founded the Chicago Project for Violence Prevention, which later came to be known as Cure Violence, and put the epidemic control model to the test in West Garfield Park in Chicago, which at the time had the highest murder rate in the city. After their first year in West Garfield Park, the neighborhood saw a 67% drop in shootings. But how do you take a system that was designed to stop the spread of a virus and use it to stop someone with a gun? Epidemic control is done from the inside out, meaning the community does the work. And that consists of several different types of workers, violence interrupters, outreach workers, hospital responders, supervisors, and it's part of a system. The Cure Violence System is built on the same basic model that the World Health Organization uses for dealing with epidemics. Interrupt transmission of the disease, prevent future spread of the disease by changing individuals' behavior, and change social norms or conditions that increase transmission. The first and arguably most important step is interrupting transmission of the disease. And in the case of violence, this means stopping someone who might be about to commit a shooting. This is where outreach workers and violence interrupters come in. Hi, everybody. My name is Chris Patterson. I'm the Senior Director of Programs and Policy at the Institute for Nonviolent Chicago. The Institute for Nonviolent Chicago is another violence prevention organization inspired by the teachings of Martin Luther King Jr. and committed to breaking the cycle of violence. We work in the communities of Austin, West Garfield Park, and Back of the Yards. Both Austin and West Garfield Park lead the city in shootings and homicides, so in a lot of ways we feel like we're in the right place at the right time. But before Chris was a senior director, he worked as an outreach worker for Cure Violence. Outreach workers and interrupters are the front line of the cure violence model. They work directly with people in the communities. They get to know what's going on, identify those who are most at risk of spreading violence, and then do whatever they can to prevent that from happening using nonviolent methods. This can be anything from being a positive role model, to talking someone down who's been shot and wants to retaliate, to negotiating a truce between rival gangs. They don't judge people, they don't make arrests, and they don't call the cops. Their sole objective is to prevent one act of violence from becoming another act of violence. If I was to sound cocky, we damn good at what we do. They're also totally badass and the subject of an excellent PBS documentary from 2011 called The Interrupters, which I highly recommend. This is unacceptable for me to be holding this young man's obituary. Schools, churches, your mama's house, those are safe zones. In order to gain the level of access that's needed to do their job, there needs to be a high level of trust. For this reason, outreach workers and interrupters are often from the communities that they serve, and in many cases, have had firsthand experience with the kind of violence they are now trying to prevent. Yeah, so my life mirrors that of a lot of young people who we work with and who we see on the community now who are trapped in a cycle of violence. Uh, both my parents had addictions, severe addictions, which uh, oftentimes led them um, to incarceration, you know, uh, stints in the hospital. I've been in foster homes, you know, and oftentimes growing up never really feeling love and value uh, and definitely not understanding my own sense of self-worth. You know, I've had a brother that was killed by violence. A lot of friends, I myself were a victim of gun violence, a gang involved, and ultimately did 12 years in the federal prison system. And that was a turning point for me, not because of prison itself, but because of the fact that for the first time, my heart, my eyes, and my ears were open to positive messaging from other black men. When I was out, I knew I would never go back to prison. It just was beneath me. I had understood my self-worth. I didn't have a lot of tools to work with. I was working three jobs. Uh, you know, I was a personal fitness trainer. I was driving a shuttle bus and I was doing some bouncing at a nightclub, strangely enough. But I just knew, like, I just wanted to work hard and I want to show my children something different about their father than what they understood. 
And so it was about six months after I was home, uh, I asked the probation officer if I could volunteer with a, a program that would allow me to speak to young men and women who were trapped in a cycle of violence. And he identified Cure Violence. And I went and for a couple months, I was just volunteering, handing out pay, you know, pamphlets and pub ed. And I just felt like, you know, I was doing violence prevention work. I felt really proud to do that kind of work. Yeah. I walk around the streets and engage people who I sit on the street. And when they found out who I was in relationship to the to the community, they hired me as a as an outreach worker and then a supervisor. Mm -hmm. Um so, you know, I've never looked back. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I I couldn't believe that, you know, you know, I could get paid to 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 talk to and service my people. Like how many people and I say that I say that humbly. Um, but because like how many people wake up every day to the job they love to do and feeling purposeful about it, right? And, and yeah. with, with regards to that, I feel very blessed. So when you first started working with Cure Violence, were you, I guess, like assigned to the neighborhood that you were from originally? Yeah, yeah. So the idea was, you know, reestablish relationships and connections from the group I was involved in and, you know, try to mediate conflicts as they would arise. Um, and, you know, and then I would have a counterpart who would work with the other group. And that was kind of like the strategy, backdoor negotiations for peace. Chris and his fellow outreach workers were intimately aware of what was going on in their communities, staying alert for situations and conflicts that could spark a violent episode. This could be anything from a dispute between rival gangs to something as simple as an argument over money, cheating boyfriend or girlfriend, or even an insult on social media. So then instead of that resulting in an escalation, someone actually being shot or killed, we have um, these workers who can then intervene and cool somebody down buy some time, help sort it out, and if the shooting doesn't happen, then other shootings that result from it won't happen, and now you've managed an epidemic. Now, if there was a shooting and there's going to be a retaliation, the team likewise has to get on top of that. This is almost like case finding and contact tracing, you know, preventing the spread of an epidemic process, which people are starting to understand better in the context of COVID. I mean, just think about this for a second. You know, all we have it for reducing violence is behavior change. All we have for COVID is behavior change. All we had for AIDS for 15 years was behavior change. Mm -hmm. And how does behavior change happen? It happens through outreach and guidance and support in taking on these new behaviors. And if the goal is to change a person's behavior, it's important to understand why people behave violently in the first place. Something that Chris can understand through his own life experience. If you're a young person that grows up in Inglewood or Austin, one of these communities in the city of Chicago, and you know maybe possibly you've seen some violence in your life at home. Mm -hmm. uh, you may have seen it and most likely have seen it in school. Uh, it is definitely in your neighborhood. And you know fighting is a, is, a, is a way of communication for you. And that is the tool in which you learn. Then what happens is when someone smacks me and I come from that environment, my reaction, my communication is online with what just happened to me. And so it's not often, let me talk down mm -hmm. this situation. Let me figure out how to you know, put someone in the middle, a mediator. It is often react with violence. And so what happens then is I, I give it to another person. And then now that person has that experience. And it just continues to happen. It's this perpetual circle that never stops. Um, very few people are taught to walk away, right? Mm -hmm. Because it looks weak, it's a passive approach. Mm -hmm. uh, but in nonviolence, we're teaching multiple ways to deal with communication mm -hmm. and conflicts, mm -hmm. right? Yes, there is violence. You can't unlearn violence once mm -hmm. it's been introduced to you. The trauma will stay with you for the rest of your life. But you can learn alternative modes and ways to speak to people, mm -hmm. uh, to resolve your conflicts. That's a really interesting. I haven't actually thought about violence as a form of communication before, but that's a that's a really interesting way of, of, of putting it. It's not an out either, right? It's not a good way of communicating. It's right. Not, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So I need to tell you in so many words that you hurt me and I, I hurt you back. Uh -huh. Right. It's not. It's, it's a horrible way of communicating, but yet it, it's still the message is clear, right? There's so many stories of the successes of Cure Violence. At a community level, well, the greatest successes is when the shootings and killings go to zero. Mm -hmm. And that's what you aim for in any epidemic control. So we have now 13 communities on the east coast of 
the U.S. and in Latin America that have gone a year to three years to zero. Whoa. That's success. One of these success stories happened in the city of San Pedro Sula in Honduras, which, when Cure Violence arrived in 2013, was ranked as the number one most violent city in the world. Cure Violence began a test program in several San Pedro communities and in 2014 saw a 94% reduction in shootings. One of the communities went 17 months without a single shooting. Cure Violence has a lot of these success stories. There is a 50% reduction in gun injuries in a Brooklyn neighborhood and a 63% drop in shootings in the South Bronx, just to name a few. The Cure Violence Network is being used not only for reducing violence, but also for reducing exposure to COVID and preventing infections with COVID. It's educating the population, same neighborhoods, on how to properly deal with COVID emergency. And that's also occurring in 20 other cities. This is not new for epidemic control. And so I worked on other epidemics for over 20 years before working on violence. And we frequently had to retrofit one um, infrastructure to uh, work another one. I was working on TB and child mortality. Then cholera came. We weren't expecting it, just like we weren't expecting COVID. And we all had to um, begin to work on the cholera epidemic using the same infrastructure. The Cure Violence Global Network is the most extensive on the ground um, network of epidemic control in the United States right now. Wow. And so it's helping with COVID um, in this emergency situation as well. Wow, that's amazing. Well, yeah, I mean, that and that kind of brings me to, to the big question here. Um, if the cure violence approach is so effective, which it sounds like it is, what what's holding us back? Why, why isn't this in every city across the country? I mean, the main challenges to cure violence are that there is an existing paradigm that looks at violence in a different way than the way that we in health look at problems. I mean, it's, it's a moralistic frame, and it's a frame that believes in punishment, and um, that's heavily invested in this uh, way of thinking. Heavily invested is right. In the U.S., the total price tag of public corrections, all of the state and federal prisons and parole and probation costs, comes out to over $80 billion a year. And this doesn't even include judicial or legal fees or the cost of policing, not to mention costs to families of victims and the incalculable emotional toll and societal damage caused by violent crime. We sink a staggering amount of money into the prison system each year, but we are also deeply politically and philosophically invested in this structure. Crime and punishment. It's a cause and effect relationship that's become so ingrained in our society that it might as well be a law of nature. Like Newton's third law of motion, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. The whole concept fits very neatly within our worldview we are taught at a young age that an act of breaking the rules is followed by a proportional act of punishment. But does it have to be this way? And is punishment effective at preventing future acts of violence? Gary doesn't seem to think so. Behaviors aren't changed by, by punishment, either although it may look like it in the first few seconds or minutes or days. But in fact, the behavior is maintained and actually made worse by, by punishment. So punishment is not over, only overvalued, it's incorrect hmm. as the way to um, try to form, maintain, or change your behavior. The future, however, is health-based systems and community-based systems. And this movement has pointed out that um, the existing system is really causing a lot of damage and toxicity, and the community doesn't want it. The voice of the community is so loud that has shed a lot of light on racial and social injustices that are happening. Mm -hmm. And we have corporations, we've got sports, we've got elected officials, we've got community. Everyone seems to understand, or at least hear now, in a way that they weren't hearing before. And so now they're saying, well, what would we do instead? But well, we were designed, Cure Violence was designed because we saw 20 years ago that this was not the right system. You can't reform the wrong system. We have a moment now that's both um, a moment of opportunity and a moment of tension and of a lot of unnecessary death from COVID and from 
uh, violence, whether it's police, whether it's um, one group against another group, whether it's a country against another country, all of these things are contagious processes that need to be, we need to elevate our thinking and see this as something of the past. We've put many things in the past. We've put leprosy in the past. We've put smallpox in the past. Violence, we, you can get rid of it by just having a, a shift in worldview to seeing it as an epidemic health problem and putting in the infrastructures and the training into place. It's a lofty goal, of course, curing the whole world of violence. But Dr. Slutkin and the Cure Violence team have demonstrated time and again that the epidemic control model works. But this can't happen all at once. It has to happen at the community level, one neighborhood at a time. This is a movement, and um, this is a really important time for us to be together and to help make change. The future is really up to us now. It's just not been written yet. It's for us to write. Big thanks to the Institute for Nonviolence Chicago and Chris Patterson for his time and for continuing the uphill struggle against violence in my city. And to Dr. Gary Slutkin and Cure Violence. If you want to know more about what they do or if you want to help the cause by donating, check out their website, link in the description. Also, thanks to Adam Hinkle for letting me use some footage from his excellent web series called The Park, which I worked on as director of photography and which was based on the work of Cure Violence outreach workers. And of course, the good stuff could not happen without the support of our wonderful Patreon patrons. If you like what we do here, head on over to patreon.com slash the good stuff and become a supporter. And while you're at it, give that subscribe button a click and the notification bell so you know when the next video is coming out. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching.